Okay, so thank you all for coming. I welcome you to the Smart Contracts Day, today, March 31st, in Athens. It's a great pleasure to have you all here today uh, for a day on smart contracts. This is the final dissemination event of the European Research Council project Coda Moda, controlling data movement in the digital age. I am the principal investigator of that project and it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to finish uh, this research effort uh, with this event and have you all here to discuss the results of the project as well as, well as collaborations that we have performed during this six years that the project took place here at the University of Athens. So we have a very nice program lined up for you. Uh, and you can see that in your screen, so also in the schedules that you have received. I'll just make now a short announcement, which is going to be in Greek. Έχετες διαθεσή σας επίσης την απευθείας μετάφραση. Σε περίπτωση που υπάρχει κάποιο πρόβλημα με τη μετάφραση, υπάρχουν οι ειχολήπτες και οι υπεύθυνοι που είναι στο πίσω μέρος της αίθουσας. Εάν έχετε οποιοδήποτε πρόβλημα, Στη μετάφραση δεν δουλεύει ο δέκτη, δεν δουλεύουν τα ακουστικά, δεν μπορείτε να βρείτε με ποιο τρόπο ε, μπορείτε να, το, το, να το τοποθετήσετε σωστά. Παρακαλώ, μιλήστε με τα παιδιά στο πίσω μέρο τη αίθουσα για να μπορέσετε να το φτιάξετε. Οκ, okay, so that was small parenthesis in Greek talking about the online translation that we have available. So, the idea of this event is uh, to have a interdisciplinary investigation. Uh, between cryptography and law. And uh, that's why the talks of the day are going to be covering both areas and we have experts <coughs> covering both sides. So, I'll just say a few words about the schedule of the day. <coughs> so I will start with a general introduction and then we're gonna have a talk by Professor Burkhard Schaefer from University of Edinburgh. After that, we're going to follow with a talk by Peter van Falkenburg. Then we're going to have our lunch, or light lunch and light bites. And then we're going to continue in the afternoon session with a talk by Christoph Sorge. After that, there's going to be a session on writing smart contracts, which is going to be presented by Dionysus Zindros and Darren McAdams. And finally, we're going to finish the day with a panel discussion where all speakers will take stage, and I hope we're going to have a lively discussion on the top of the day. So please collect uh, a lot of thoughts and ideas and questions, and hopefully in this way we're going to have a lively discussion on our final uh, slot of the day with all the speakers. The topic, of course, is cryptography and law. And with this, I'm going to get started, and I'll give you a general overview of this area and an effort to converge those two together in this talk which I called Cryptography and Law, an unexpected <coughs> encounter that was obvious all along. As we'll see, the concept of a smart contract is the epitome of that meeting between these two areas. And that's why smart contracts were selected as the topic of today's uh, research day and presentations. So all the talks of the day are gonna be touching on that idea. And for that reason, I will present a high level overview of what is a smart contract, starting with some motivation about how to design those systems that support smart contracts. So before we delve into that, I would like to give you a little bit of perspective, like a high level view of what is law and what is cryptography and why you can view them together from a similar perspective. So you can think that law regulates interactions between persons, ensuring fairness and basic rights. And when we talk about persons, we don't not necessarily 
um, thing of persons of actual physical persons, but it could be groups of persons or legal persons. So we need law because we need to have protections of persons from other persons that may have conflicting interests. And law works because we have social institutions that support the rule of law. And we can refer to those institutions when needed. So interactions take place in the way they're supposed to do. And when things go wrong, we can revert to those social institutions, which is the judicial system, the police, and so forth. The, and those institutions will enforce the rule of law. So if you look at the textbook definition of cryptography, you will observe that it doesn't look related at all. So the textbook definition would say, cryptography is the science of communicating secret messages in the presence of an adversary. And this is, in some sense, true if you think about the history of cryptography. But today, this is wrong. Cryptography is not that. And that's a very important point that you can take away from this presentation. So this is one of the important takeaway points. This is not what cryptography is about today. So what is cryptography as it is now? So a proper definition that describes what cryptography does at a high level is the following. It's the science of redistributing trust in any system that emerges from the interaction of multiple persons. And if you actually take that specification, it is very easy to take any task that you can describe in the context of modern cryptography and think about as a system that describes relationships between persons, as long as you understand the notion of a person in a broad way. So this is not actually a physical person, right? But it could be a system. It could be a robot. It could be a tunnel. But it has or satisfies the concept of a person in the same broad sense that this term is used in law. So for example, just to make the contrast with the traditional definition of cryptography, sending a message securely is a three-person protocol. There is one person, let's say Alice, that would like to send a message to another person, say Bob, and they're connected with a channel, Charlie, which is a third person that will play the role of taking messages from one person to the other. Trusting Charlie not to read the messages that Alice sends to Bob and back gives you a security for that protocol of message exchange that could be protected, for instance, in a legal way. Charlie, for example, could sign an agreement that would never read the messages that it transfers between Alice and Bob. And that would give you an implementation of a secure channel. Now, cryptography addresses that problem and is able to redistribute trust in that interaction. So in this way, cryptography protects persons from other persons with conflicting interests. And contrary to law, protection is not achieved by using social institutions and constructs but is achieved by relying on hard mathematical problems. And this is the hallmark of how cryptography operates and redistributes trust. So 
It is helpful as an introduction to the notion of the smart contract to understand what is money and how we can implement money. By thinking about money, it's something useful because first, it's something that we all understand. Second, it is something that frequently people have conflicting interests about. So it's a useful paradigm to understand the difficulties of implementing a medium of exchange like money. So we're going to go through like a short history of how money works and what does it try to achieve. So what is money? There are three basic properties that something should have in order to be called money. It should be a medium of exchange, which basically means it can be used as a medium for the exchange of goods, which basically suggests that I'm able to exchange something with you without bartering on specific items. So for example, if I have tomatoes and you have potatoes, there's no need to figure out the proper exchange rate between those two items so that I can get some of the items you have and you some of mine. We can translate that to an actual amount that is going to be using this concept of money and we can use that as the exchange. Second, it should be a unit of account. It should, can be used for pricing of all goods and services. We can use it for accounting and debt recording. Kind of window. And finally, it should be a store of value. So we can store it, retrieve it at a later time, and it will still maintain its value. So these are the three basic properties that we need to have an implementation for money. So people have actually understood that money is useful very early on in the history of human society. And they also understood more or less its properties. You'd be surprised about the things that people have used some, as money in historical times. So for example, peppercorns were used as money. Shells were used as money. And of course, gold. Is that good money? That's the question now. Well, that's money 1.0. Let's think about it. Is it a good implementation of money? So as a medium of exchange, is mediocre. It's a physical object. We can carry it around in our pockets. And then you can go to someone with your pocket full of peppercorns and try to pay with that. <coughs> it could work, but it's not great. We can agree to that. As a unit of account, it's also mediocre. You can try to do accounting with peppercorns, but it's not divisible very well. Also, it can be forgeable. And that's an issue also with how good it is as a store of value. So a store of value is pretty bad. Objects can deteriorate. And also, there may be unknown quantities of the object that could lead to its fluctuation. So by having, let's say, a peppercorn farm, it could become rich. Does that make sense? Not really. So money 1.0 is not good. People discovered that early on and tried to make it better. We need to find ways to make things better because money worked for society. So that's money 2.0. And that's the back of Scotland. So trusted entities. 
How does that work as money? So you can forget sort of using a physical object. I mean, we could still use a physical object, but now it's not the object itself that will have the value. It could be something like a piece of paper, like saying that this is something that represents x value. And that piece of paper is going to be issued by a trusted entity, sometimes called like an IOU. So we are familiar with this money. It's the money that we use a lot. And it can take a lot of forms. It can be physical. It can be virtual in the forms of debit and credit cards. It's still the same. It's trusted party money. And it's trusted party because there is an entity that guarantees its value. So this is money 2.0. So how good it is as a medium of exchange? It's reasonably good. Of course, you can understand that it's somewhat limited. The value of this money is within the perimeter that the trusted entity is recognized. I remember I was traveling to some small neighborhood in the outskirts of London, and I had with me some money printed by the Bank of Scotland. You may know that the Bank of Scotland prints its own money, even though they are proper British pounds. So I was in this very small shop, just outside London, and I presented some of these Scottish pounds. And the big guy, the cashier, like, looked at me and said, no, that, that's not what I expect to see. And then I had to explain, no, it's still British pounds, really. It's fine that Elizabeth is not there, and it's a fish. <laughs> because that's what was there, it was a fish. But, so it took some, took some effort. Luckily it was only five pounds, so you may have thought, what the heck, probably it's fine. So, there are limitations there as a medium of exchange. Maybe you have to convince sometimes. Um, but even worse, you'll have to suffer exchange between these perimeters. Because at the end, they will not be acceptable if you are in a completely different locale which uses its own trusted entities. So you have to exchange, and by doing the exchange, you have to suffer penalty for that. So a security of account is great, though. And this was the great success behind uh, Money 2.0, because it's fungible and divisible, basically means that any amount of it is as good as any other amount, and we can use it for accounting and doing all that. But as a store of value, it's mediocre. I mean, it works as long as the trusted entity is sufficiently long-lived and has good reputation, but really, especially today, we all understand that money 2.0 is not necessarily a good store of value. So, innovate. So Bitcoin, which I assume many of you have heard, or some of you even are intimately familiar with, is money 3.0. So we have to understand what it is and why it works. And I'll try to give you a description of how Bitcoin works. Because the way it works is also at the core of what is a smart contract. And I will do that via a parable. Because there is really no need for technical details to understand all the logic behind the way Bitcoin works. And I call this parable the never-ending book parable. 
So, what's the never-ending book? It's a book of transactions. Basically, it records everything that has happened in terms of interactions with stakeholders of that currency. And you can easily see that basically this is what also the way that we implemented money 2.0. That's the money 2.0 implementation. It's essentially a book. But that book, it's the bank or the trusted entity. And that's also like the deficiency that money 2.0 has. Trusted entity is not trust anymore the book can disappear or rewritten. So this is the core property that systems like Bitcoin address is solving in a different way the way this book is implemented. And this is how the parable is going to go. It's going to explain how this works. So every new page requires some effort to produce. You have to also as you follow the parable, think all of this in a metaphorical sense. I will connect them to reality when the time is right. Anyone can be a scribe and produce a page. That's a difference. New pages are produced indefinitely, as long as scribes are interested in doing so. So anyone can be a scribe, and pages will go on forever as long as nobody else, nobody wants to do it anymore. So this sounds OK, but you might notice that there is an issue. Don't we have to agree, actually, on the contents of that? Because if each one of us has its own version of the book, it doesn't sound very useful as money. So if multiple conflicting books exist, because you can imagine if there are multiple books, I can make a book that I'm rich. And that's my favorite book. So clearly, that would not work. So which is the right book? Well, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's the rule. The book with the most pages is the right book. So this sounds a little bit counterintuitive, like I could make my own book with the most pages. But remember, there is effort required to produce a page. So therefore, might be it is not that easy myself to make my own book with the most pages. That's an important point, which we will explore more in the next couple of slides. Also, it could be that multiple books exist with the same number of pages. In that case, the rule is that it doesn't matter. Just pick one. So in some sense, you would see that this suggests that the history might look like that. There are these pages of the book, and then there are like other pages here which are like comparable pages. And basically, assembling the book is like stringing like the sequence of pages with their numbers until I find the one that is the longest. So in this case, the sequence of eight pages is the book, as opposed to the sequence that finishes here, with just seven pages. So if the world is like that, there are these like four versions of the book then we're going to get all to the same one, which is the one finishing at page eight. The remaining pages are like orphans, like pages of the book that were attempted, but were not adopted in its history. And we will see that this is, also, this is actually fine. There is no problem on having such orphans. In some sense, this is an artifact of the point that we are creating this book together. And we will accept that. So what are the rules of extending the book? So the first scribe, because we're all scribing, 
that discovers a page will announce it to everyone else. But doing that, finding a page, finding a page, producing a page, requires some effort. I'm not going to go to the details of what exactly is that effort. But you can think of it as a sort of a game. It's like a game of backgammon. Backgammon is actually a favorite game in Greece. It's a game that my grandfather, for example, taught me. And I always enjoyed by how much he uh, enjoyed playing it and winning because he was an awesome backgammon player. In the local coffee shop in his neighborhood, it was impossible to beat him. So his technique was the way he was rolling the dice. He claimed that he was rolling them in a certain way. And this was a claim that, of course, was disputed by myself. But he never took it back. So a similar process is performed for producing a page. It's like rolling a set of dice, hoping to get the right combination. You keep rolling the dice, and when you get the right combination, that is the hallmark that you have produced a page. <coughs> so the only way to produce a page is by performing this process on and on. So here you are. The dice are rolling, and one of those guys got the next page. That's weird. Money cannot be just rolling dice. Is that really necessary? It turns out that this probabilistic nature is paramount for this implementation to work. We need the dice. They're not there as a game. They're useful for something. What is that? So imagine there are two scribes that are working together. They have no coordination. They may not even know each other. Let's say one is here in Greece and another is in Japan. They never met and they're working on the next page. How can they even coordinate? So randomness is the tool that makes that system to work. Because given that they need to roll a lot of dice in order to get the next page, it is unlikely that they will continuously be lucky together. One page, one page, one page, one page. This can happen because of randomness. Because of randomness, one of the two scribes is going to go ahead of the other. <laughs> and assuming now that they can talk to each other, and that's a key point, and that's way looking far ahead, that's why this Money 3.0 needs the internet to work, then the scribe that is left behind will abide and adopt the page that was produced by the one that went ahead. So, anyone can be a scribe for the book, but you have to have a set of dice. So now that was Sounds like anyone, but it's one of those things that is some sort of caveat. The good thing is that, oops, 
The good thing is that you can go get the dice from the computer store around the corner. Nothing special is needed to introduce you as a scribe. And this is a key property of that system. The only thing you need to have is a computer. And the more dice one has, actually, the higher likelihood it is to produce a winning combination to make a page. So if you want more dice, you can get more of them. Because that basically means dice would be equivalent to how much computing power you have. So multiple scribes will exist. And a probability of a page being extended by one would be proportional to how, how many dice they have. And here is an example of how this can be spread between four different scribes that have invested different <coughs> amounts of resources for playing that game. So let's see how we use 3.0 money, the book. So let's say the seller wants to give a bicycle to the buyer, very fine purchase details, address for payment, there is some interaction, and now the payment is broadcasted in this network of scribes. It's just the internet in practice. The scribes, they produce pages of the book, and soon enough, the payment appears in one of the pages. The seller verifies that the payment is confirmed by checking the book, the current version of the book. If everything is fine, puts the admin for delivery, and the bicycle is with the bike. So this is how Money 3.0 would work. So with all that, let's go back to the question. Can you manipulate the book? What is the rule to use? in order to make sure that we all agree in the end on one version. We said the more pages, that's the current version. So this is the rule that we're going to use in order to confirm a payment. So the more pages that pile up on top of a page, the less likely it is to have the page removed from the book. And that's a very important statement, theorem, if you want, about this system. So how long you have to wait, it really depends on what you have to sell. If it's a bicycle, you're going to wait that many pages. If it's a cheeseburger, maybe less. If it's a car, maybe more. And there is a way to decide how many. So suppose that someone wants to subvert that. Someone wants to change the book. So here is this right here who is not quite the same as the other ones. He just likes his own version of the book better. And it's that version of the book where he's actually rich. And he says, I'm going to be doing here my own book. And my own book is going to be conveniently having transactions to my advantage. So here is the evil scribe, which, let's say, represents 30% of the total dice throwing power. And here's the rest, which they're not bad, and they just follow the process. So now you can feel that even though he can do that, he is at a disadvantage. The rate of pages that he produces is less than all the others collectively. And this is key. The point is that as long as this guy is less than 50% in terms of rolling dice potential, then one version of the book is guaranteed to exist. And actually, it's possible to graph this. And this is a graph, which you don't have to read it, but it's a graph that then illustrates the previous point. So what's the connection of the parable to reality? So the book, there's no book really, it's called the blockchain. 
It's really the same. The scribe, there are no scribes really. They're called miners, and they are computer systems that organize transactions in blocks. And these blocks, you can think of them as pages of the book. Producing a page and rolling the dice is also different in reality. Producing a page is actually solving a cryptographic puzzle which is so-called moderately hard to solve. Not too hard, not too easy. That means basically it requires some small amount of effort to do it. Rolling a set of dice is using a computer to test a solution from a large space of candidate solutions for the puzzle. It's really like trying to solve a crossword puzzle blindly, on and on and on, trying to see what set of words fit, until you find it. This is how it works in reality. So how is this as 3.0? So as minimum exchange is improving. And I'm saying it's improving because it works globally, but you need to have an internet connection. So as long as people are connected to the internet, this works. So unit of account is great. As great was money 2.0. And as a store of value is good because there's no trusted third parties. <coughs> You just trust the integrity of that whole system. And as long as we understand its properties, we can trust it. Because we are not trusting a single entity with it. There is no single point of failure. And this is the hallmark of a secure system. So just because it works, it doesn't mean it will be used and it's safe. So here is the graph of Bitcoin price over the years. It's very volatile. And that does not have to do with its intrinsic properties as money 3.0, but it has to do with the, the way society perceives it. This perception and the perception of the technology behind it is improving because our understanding of the technology improves and validates its usefulness. So what is the relationship to smart contracts? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Since we created the book, why just record money? I mean, as useful as money is, it's boring. It's just money. There's so many more interesting things that people do that we can use the book to record them. And this is where smart contracts come to place. So we can encode in the book's pages arbitrary relations between persons. And more or less, and moreover, What's very interesting about that is that scribes now can actually not just check that the relations are recorded properly, but they can also check that stakeholders comply to contractual obligations as described in the contract and take actions if they do not. So this is the notion of a smart contract. So a smart contract, the way it works, it's a piece of code that is written in a formal language that records all terms for a certain engagement between a set of persons. Let's call them the stakeholders. The stakeholders are identified by their accounts. And when I say accounts, these are identifiable um, entries in the book. And the smart contract has a public state and it will self-execute each time a certain trigger condition is fulfilled. You can actually think of the smart contract as a virtual person that is there, implemented 
distributively by all the scribes and will execute the code that is given. I'll give you one application, which I would call the Sugarman problem in intellectual property. Maybe some of you um, saw this very nice documentary about the Sugarman, in particular Sixto Rodriguez. He was a very moderately or not that successful rock star in the 70s. He had very, very little success, played a few gigs in native US, had some little success in Australia. His uh, fame quickly dissipated. And then he turned to other more menial things like working in construction. He didn't know that in South Africa he was a hero and his records were played by everyone. And he was as famous as the Beatles. He did not know that. If you want to see like this an amazing story, and Searching for Superman is a 2015 documentary, which if you haven't seen, I would recommend it. So basically what happens here is that we have a third party problem in intellectual property management that separates the artist for the, from the consumer of the art. So here is how a smart contract would solve the Sugarman problem, which basically is the artist nearly dying penniless while someone else sell their art. This is exactly what's happening there. So in a smart contract, what happens is when the artist posts work of art, and now he can self-publish, because we do have the internet. He can also create a smart contract to manage the licensing of the work. So the smart contract and the work of art together, they are becoming public. Now, if someone wants to use the work, he can download it. Let's say, just for the sake of this example, think of it, that's a photograph. And here is a photographer that puts that photograph in his website. And then here is another user of that photograph that would like to take the photograph and put it on another website, let's say a news agency website, and would like to use that photograph as part of a news article. So he downloads the work, inserts it in an article, and then interacts with the smart contract to receive the license. Receiving the license is done automatically by the smart contract, and payment is also received and recorded by the smart contract. The artist can be completely offline in this process, and this can be happening without the artist understanding that it actually takes place. Nevertheless, whenever the artist wants to, he can wake up, go check the smart contract, and receive all the royalties that the artist deserves. At the same time, here, the work will be used. And because it will be used publicly, it's possible to build an auditing system that will scan all publications of the work and verify that a proper license has been acquired. The important point is that all of this can also be automated exactly because we have the smart contract. So here is how a smart contract could solve that Superman problem. So this guy now, instead of construction, can actually enjoy these royalties that are produced by the work that they have publicized. So the young work and modern publication, the artist can be offline. The smart contract will automatically furnish license and recording of payment. Royalties will accrue in the blockchain, the book, and will be cryptographically secured until they are claimed by the artist. So nobody will be able to access those royalties but the artist, who will possess the secret key information 
to unlock those royalties. Auditing can be made automatic, and websites in license violation will be reported and penalized. The nice thing is that incentivizing this auditing can also work and be funded by the smart contract itself. So here's the takeaway points for intellectual property. Sharing is not prohibited, so as before, but royalty collection, lawful use, and compliance is automatically facilitated by the smart contract. In the end, we managed to remove the middleman between the artist and the user. I have a second example for you, but I'm going to skip it. And I will welcome discussion on this during the break and during the day. But there are numerous other examples for smart contracts and how they can enhance the way people interact. And that example, which I'll skip, is about how to design rental agreements in the blockchain. So I'm skipping that. It was nicely drawn with a lot of arrows. <laughs> Put a lot of effort for those arrows, I should say. I was drawing them. OK. Many applications, many more applications of smart contracts. Land registries, financial instruments, general rental leasing agreements. There is no end to the interesting things that uh, we can do uh, with this system. There's a lot of challenges, as you could have possibly suspect. Um, and I'll just, in bullet style, just mention some of them. And some of them you will also hear in the coming presentations. So privacy is, is, is a key problem. Um, all this, the book is public, after all. And you could start like worrying, OK, it's very interesting. It's public. Anybody can extend it. But what about like putting that information there? We have to do something to protect them. The efficiency of the representation. The book itself, like if we want to record everything in it, it's going to grow so large, it's going to be hard to manage. We need to understand how to make it efficient and scale it uh, so that it can actually record everything we need. We need to also make sure that contracts are verifiable and correct and correspond to the actual intent they're designed to. This is also a very big question. Also, we have to worry about the expressibility of them and how well do they capture actual policy. So how do we translate from actual policy, <coughs> classical policy, non-smart contracts to smart contracts? How do we do these translations? Are these contracts expressible enough? And how, what are the tools that we need to use both legal and uh, information uh, based that could be used to do this translation. So looking into the future and wrapping up uh, this introduction to our uh, smart contract day, um, I'm putting up this notion of what I would call a crypto legal framework. It's a framework basically that encompasses both cryptographic concepts and legal con concepts fused into one. Basically, merging both of these areas, we actually will be able, I do believe, to regulate interactions of persons, with the broad definition of what a person is, at a global scale. In this way, I would state that at the end, we will be able to transcend geographical and jurisdictional boundaries of today and create one dynamic global institution which will belong to all and can be abused by none. This is the dream. And this is where also I will finish. And I hope that you'll be inspired by this and get engaged with this technology and these concepts. So thank you very much. So um, 
I'm happy that we have one or two questions, if there are any. And after that, there will be a um, break for coffee, and we'll continue with our second talk. If you have a question, uh, please um, ask it on that microphone and um, making sure that the microphone works. So um, any questions for the audience? Something that, please, would you like to um, use the microphone? It may have an on-off switch, actually, which is, can we actually have some help? <coughs> It's actually just the okay. Well, I very much enjoyed your wonderful presentation. Very attractive, very stimulating. I just have one uh, question and comment. When you uh, yeah, please talk to the microphone. So that, yeah. that's fine. You can yeah, please talk to the microphone. So we have it. Of your presentation when you spoke about. Book metaphor and the and the currency and 3.0. You omitted one point, uh, which is inflation. What happens if there are too many pages being written? And doesn't this destroy the historical value? Isn't block? Isn't Bitcoin intrinsically deflationary just to avoid this point? Yeah. So thank you for the question. Um, so. Um, the issue of inflation or deflation is something that is an issue of economic policy. And interestingly, it can be engineered in any such system. Um, calibrating the effort that requires to produce pages is something that is part of the design of the underlying system. It's, it is a critical point of the design. And I'm glad that it was brought up because this was one of the main research efforts that we undertook during the uh, six years of uh, the project Coda Moda, which project now, this is the final dissemination event. The good thing is that we analyzed the way that the difficulty of the page calculation calibrates, and we found that it actually aligns well with as an indicator of how much effort and interest exists in the system. So basically what Bitcoin has is a way to recalibrate the difficulty of page production so that the more interest the system has, the more difficult it becomes to produce pages. Our analysis has shown that this works reasonably well without necessarily saying that this is the final point. So my answer to this is that these are important concerns, but we do have the tools to analyze and understand them. And it is possible to engineer within the systems the safeguard mechanisms to calibrate and the system and meet these concerns. <coughs>